Oh, we lost Alex. I don't know what the hell's going on with my internet, bro. Boy, Alex, you're having some connectivity issues, aren't you? I don't know what the hell's going on, man. In my shortage right What's up, guys, and welcome to the After Hours Podcast. We have special guest Mari here, as well as Alex and Joe. Uh, Mari, it's great to have you on. Um, maybe you could tell us just a bit about kind of your journey. I know you've talked about it on a lot of other different kind of like podcasts and stuff like that. So maybe just like short description of kind of how you found trading, how you got into it, um, stuff like that. Well, thank you guys for having me on. And I got started almost like right after high school because my dad is an entrepreneur himself. So he always wanted me to have a job for myself. And it was kind of interesting because all throughout high school, I kind of wanted to have a job like my friends. I was like, why can't I work at Market Basket or Hannaford or an ice cream shop? I don't know. I kind of really want to start doing something. And my dad would always say no. And once I started trading, he kind of like explained to me that he didn't want to get me into like that mindset of the nine to five job kind of. He wanted me to have like different perspectives on like different routes that I could take. It could be the the traditional route which is the one that I thought I would take which was go to college and you know then eventually get a job or it was just to start trading and work for myself so those were like the two options that he kind of gave me and he said I'll be okay with either but this is like something you can do and this can be something kind of like cool that you can start so he would send me a bunch of finance articles which I didn't really understand that much at first but I came across an ad for Tim Sykes and that's how I got started. So he kind of like spoke to a younger audience and it kind of resonated with me a little bit, like the language. I was like a little bit more comfortable with the idea of trading than I was with investing or any other of that sort of stuff because Mm -hmm. they're kind of like speaking to an older audience. So that's what drew me into trading in the first place. And I gave it a shot and I started in 2018 and I got the challenge, but I didn't really like trading at first. So I kind of just took that year off. I just got the challenge, but I was like, well, I'm not really very interested. Just seemed a little like boyish for me in a way. Yeah. So I didn't understand it at all either because I didn't even open my platforms till 2019. But anyways, I didn't want to like let the challenge go to food, go to waste. So I still kept learning and I still kept kind of like, watching the videos, watching the webinars, but still I was like a little bit hesitant on it. Then I went to Columbia for a year and that was kind of like an eye opener for me because it showed me that sometimes it is very difficult to make money and also like work for somebody else based on like the examples that I saw. So then I realized like how blessed the opportunity was to be able to work for myself and to see how good it is to just work from home and not have to kind of talk to a lot of people and I can just have my own schedule be free so I realized that and then I came back and I started in 2019 full-time opened up my brokers opened up two brokers and that's like pretty much when I started when you first started did you see like instant success because like when I first started every single stock I bought crashed and I was like am I doing something wrong like what's going on here? So like when you started, did you like see success instantly or was it kind of like, uh, it took you some time to get there? It definitely took me some time. It was like my first four or five months, but I mean, I kind of started to really understand it after like five months, but for the first five months, I thought I was up maybe like $600. And then it was a real heartbreaker when I saw like all of my accounts and I was still getting used to the platforms and I was actually down like Mm -hmm. three to 4,000 when I thought I was up. It was like mainly all on commissions, over trading, not knowing what I was doing, getting used to the platforms and kind of using size that I shouldn't have been using in the first place. And just OTCs, I started kind of trading them a lot more. So over trading them and trading five to 10 times throughout the day can really um, eat you up in commissions. So that's when it was like an eye opener. And then I kind of tried to like switch things back around and yeah, it was very hard for like five to six months. So maybe, what was it? Okay. You, Joe, you can go. What was it exactly that you think propelled you 
from kind of being in the background, just being a trader into the spotlight? I mean, I kind of, it was like around June or July. It was like around July when I crossed PDT. And that's kind of when I understood like what I was actually doing. And it did take a little bit, but once I was able to like flip the switch, that was when I understood when I started to understand my personality. And I think that's like a really important aspect of like trading and actually understanding your personality because you can study a lot and you can watch a lot of videos and you can be very prepared. But I think I started to really understand what was going on when I started to know my personality and trading. And that's kind of like what switched my point of view. And that's like what pretty much started my journey but like it was once i figured out what worked for me and my personality yeah maybe you could kind of talk about like not going into like too much specifics but like the types of setups that kind of worked for like you and your personality like was it like otc breakout or like listed longs or shorts i tried everything but for a whole year i tried all of the otc different types of patterns and then i kind i got very comfortable with the otc panic dip buy Mm -hmm. So then that same December, January, and February, that was when we had the OTC mania. So that was when I was able to exponentially grow after I took eight months of only focusing on that type of setup. How have you like adapted to this new market? Because, you know, when we had the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, everyone was just printing money. And then 2022 comes along with the market crashes. And everyone's all of a sudden burning their money. And now we're in 2023. We're starting to see a little bit of a rebound. So how have you kind of adjusted to the bear market cycle that we're in? I definitely feel like this is like the first kind of like first three to four months where I'm very comfortable with what I'm doing. But the past year, it did take a a really long time to kind of like adapt. And I would make some money. I would lose some money. But I still was like, I got back to that beginner stage. It was like, I was an expert. And then you get back to like that beginner stage because now you have to pretty much, pretty much teach yourself again, what you already taught yourself because now that pattern stopped working. So I've adapted to short gapper on listed socks. And that has worked for me really well. I've been trading it for like a year or two. And I think it's very consistent as well, but, it's kind of like the inverse panic to buy and that just fit in my personality. So that's how like I've adapted. So in 2019 and 2020, there was still kind of this small bit of life to the OTC market. Like there was a little bit of stuff that would run or it would, or it would quietly move. And then, you know, the typical pump and dump schemes that stayed there. Is that still something that's part of your strategy in the OTC world? Or have you had to kind of fully transition out of that? Because from what I've noticed, and maybe it's not what I'm seeing is different from what you what you see or what you do. But for the last two years, it really seems like since the kind of GameStop and Wall Street bets, it took all attention out of those worlds and moved them into the listed world. So for me, I feel like I feel like there are a lot of setups, even if it's big cap, small cap, or OTCs. I'll still take it with the right risk if I see a pattern there that I recognize and I like it, because there's a lot of like big cap that you can see and it's an A plus setup. So I'll still take it, but it's just not like my comfort zone. Like I know here is like my home. And then here's like, yeah, it's like my second home. I understand it, but I'll still take almost like any trade. We had HC, NWF, and we also had the bankrupt stocks, um, SIBBQ. So I'll still trade them. It's just a matter of recognizing the pattern, knowing that I'm comfortable with it. But I know that a gapper, like I can understand it. And it's like my comfort home every day to make consistent gains. And then if there's like an outlier trade in any other type of setup, then I'll still take it. OTCs was exactly how I started as well. I went down that road and they've got a special place in my heart, man. But things... I look at it and I go, OTCs are dead. So, I mean, for Mari, are OTCs dead? Do you think they are or no? I definitely think they are. They'll have like little spurts of like trying to come back to life, but yeah, they're not. But I do believe or I hope that they'll come back. 
because yeah, I mean, I remember the days of like great. ENVV, <laughs> like ENVV and like Z, what was it? Z something it, like all of those. Yeah, we weirdest like, tickers, bro. Weirdest oh, tickers. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Like NXTFF. Like I remember all these tickers. Like I, I just wanted the IDGAF to ever come around, but it never did. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But dude, my favorite was like they would pump it and pump it and pump it. And one of the traders that I've always looked up to was Michael Good. Yeah. And I loved the research that he always did. And so I got to really digging on those OTCs and I would short those. But I would have to get tricky with interactive brokers because that was like the only places you could get the OTC borrows. Every morning I would come in on like a like a ticker like NXTFF is the one I remember the most. I'd have to jump in there. And I'd have to put shares to start scaling in so that I would, the first thing I would do is I would log in. I'd put like 500 shares to short of NXTFF and just leave it and wait for it to fill. Because the way interactive brokers worked is as soon as those borrows, as soon as somebody sold those shares and like covered them and they were available again, it would fill whatever next order was most available after that. Did you ever do any strategies like that? So I didn't start shorting after the OTC kind of like started to trickle off like around April or May. Mm -hmm. So I never really actually got short. I definitely think there were a lot of opportunities to like get short. Eventually I did once like I got back to the beginner stage and then I had to relearn other strategies, get comfortable with it, learn my personality and listed, know what I was doing. So for OTCs, it was just mainly going long. And it was also very tricky because you had to literally get the bottom in order to get a fill because you already knew that there were way bigger traders than I was that were just taking huge sides. So you just had to be quick and know like the right stall time and kind of just like go for it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, how would you say that you kind of go about managing risks on your trades? I guess now, um, yeah, like how, what's your kind of like risk management like? My risk management, well, I kind of like taught myself to understand entries very well. So I kind of like when a stock, when I'm like either short or long and it starts working in my favor right away, and then I can just cover a little bit and get like a cushion. And then I can just either re-add or wait for like a longer time. So I do like when my entry is working in my favor or I can just risk like 10 to 20 cents if I take a short I can just risk high day and it's not really that much, that much of like risk for me. I would rather keep it like less, like more risk free. <laughs> so let's say you take a short and you're risking high of day. What, what is your, what is your mindset on adding to that position? Do you find yourself as more of kind of a one shot, one kill type of trader where you're just going in with a few thousand shares making 30 to 50 cents? cleaning up for the day or do you find um that you are as soon as you're reacting to it are you more of a reactive person where you're watching the tape or are you more about the chart and how do you size into those trades i think it really just like depends on if it's like an a plus or a b plus or a c plus and then i'll either add size if like it's truly worth it but if i'm just trying to stay consistent throughout like the day and throughout the days, then I'm just going to like take less size, just like one shot, one kill. And just kind of like, it's almost like practice, like here, practice, here, practice. And then when the better trade comes along, then I'll think about adding and I'll think about maybe risking a lot more if it is like a trade that it is actually worth it for me. So a new trader coming into the, into this game, would you tell them to focus more on the chart or more on the tape? to get consistency? I think they're both really important. I definitely feel like I couldn't trade without either of them, but I think, I don't know. I feel like both are like just as easily, just as important. I guess it really also depends on the pattern that you're trading. And like, if I'm trading a gap, I definitely need to understand. The taper, if I'm trading a panic dip, I definitely really need to understand where it is that is stalling in order to take it short or a long, and then I can just risk the highs of that. But I think both are important to practice 
And just basic technical analysis, I feel like should be in everybody's hearts once you want to like scale up. Because in the beginning, you won't understand either of them. But memorizing it and then eventually practicing it more, it should just like live in our hearts and just kind of be like home for us pretty much. Yeah. So what was it like to cross the million dollar profit mark for yourself? It was... um, I think it was really quick. I did definitely, I was not expecting that. I actually set out like a few goals for myself that when I hit like 25, then I would be like over a million and it happened that same year. So I was not expecting that at all. And in a sense that kind of made it like less exciting because I was working a lot in order, like I, we were just going over time during that time. So I didn't even really have a lot of time to like sit and actually think about what just happened because it was like three, was four months. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a lot and we still had to like keep working. So it was like next day, you kind of just have to reset and just start again. You didn't really have time because you were just wasting time kind of like celebrating and said, you just had to work the next day. That's how it felt for me. So do you yeah. have, were you just doing it on your own or were you doing it with like a group of people? Did you have a group of people that you talked to or were you just kind of solo, like nobody talked to me? I'm in my zone. <laughs> I definitely had people to talk to and I'm going to give a shout out to Jack Kellogg, of course, because he was also a great help throughout my trading journey. And I am super grateful because, you know, if you know Jack Kellogg, obviously, you know how hard worker he is. Yeah. And it just kind of like pushes you knowing who your friends are and who the people that you love are like that says a lot about you as well so it only pushes you a lot harder if you know that the people you're around are also ones that are doing amazing things kind of like pushes you a lot right. more if you're closer to yeah. people that are doing amazing things yeah boy alex you're having some connectivity issues aren't you i don't know what the hell's going on man in my shortage right now i guess there's an internet shortage i don't know what the heck's <laughs> going on bro my wi-fi's out, I got no idea what's going on here. And honestly, this kind of brings me to a good – I'm stressed out right now. This camera's not working. But in trading, trading could be very – what do you do to combat stress in trading? What do you do to kind of – because as magical as trading is, you know, making millions and millions of dollars, you know, it really is stressful. And I think every trader probably has, like, something that helps release – so what is that for you? I definitely feel like I have to detach from the market once I'm like away from the market. So I feel like that's really helped me because I'm very close to my family. And I also kind of like love being outside. So I think one of the things that kind of helps me combat stress is knowing that when the market closes, it's almost like a new day for me. And I get to do something kind of like go on a walk or just hang out with my family or eat some food but always hey, not go. like always thinking oh not like always thinking about how stressful the day was but kind of being able to disconnect for a little bit and know that tomorrow is a new day and the next opportunity is right around the corner and if you made a mistake you go in you analyze and you kind of just like relax because what's done is done so you kind of just got to focus on your next trade. That's how I see things. Very powerful yeah. mindset because it, with the way it sounds, it's like as soon as the market closes, you can do your review, you do whatever you got to do. And then you're like, you know what? I'm taking the market hat off and I'm putting on the enjoy my life, relax, yeah. cash from the market. Do you think having a partner like that, that understands the stresses of trading and is supportive in that helped you get to that next level a lot of traders there's two sides of the coin right we've probably all heard the success and downfall of these traders that number one they either have a partner or a spouse that does not like what they're doing this does not believe that they have are going to find any success in this they're risking their family's money they're risking their their livelihood all kinds of things like that and then there's the other side of the coin which is most of the traders that you hear that had success had a supportive partner or spouse in that situation. So do you think that that helps you reach that next level? Definitely did. It helps a lot emotionally because sometimes we lose perspective 
on what is like normal. So you might go up to like, so I could go up to like someone and say, oh, I lost, but they would be like, oh, but you made so much. And I'm like, no, that's not the point. My execution was terrible. I traded on discipline. I was super stressed. Today was such a long day. And you kind of just like want want to like talk about it, but they will see the bigger picture, but we're looking at the daily. So I think that's really important to be able to talk to someone about like what goes on in the daily and knowing that they have the right perspective. They'll understand you if they've been there also. So I think it's really good. You want them to get yeah. hyped with you. You're like those freaking people <laughs> running that stuff exactly. Freaking just get hyped with me. Yeah. yeah. If somebody else that doesn't understand that, it's like, yeah, but <laughs> okay. Yeah. You have like a, a lot of money. And you're like, no, yeah. that's not the point. <laughs> I have you more. Have exactly. Only traders get. Yeah. Yeah. When you uh, when you became profitable, I guess like did you find that like any relationships changed between like family or friends? Like was it awkward or weird to talk about like how much like how much you were making? Because for me, it was it was honestly like really difficult because every time I would go out, everyone would be like, "Oh, drinks are on Harry, drinks are on Harry," you know. Or people would ask me about trading, and like I was from a small town and. You know, sometimes I did, you know, I was like, fuck it. Like, we're all getting drunk tonight. We're all having a good time. We're all partying. But it's like, sometimes when you're done trading and you just want to have a drink, you know, or you just want to do whatever or hang out with your friends, like you don't really want to talk about it that much. So like, did it impact like your, your friends or like your family or any stuff like that? Keep in mind, they may watch this. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) My little stalkers. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't think so that much because they also saw like the struggles and they saw like the gains. So I also don't really talk about it that much. I try to detach from trading as much as I can. So whenever I'm with my friends, they barely know. And if they do, they can just look me up and they'll know. But it's not something that I was that I was really kind of talking about and also kind of like trading terminology. They won't really understand what I'm really talking about so I Mm -hmm. kind of try to separate the lives and then if I'm talking with like traders like I think it's with like trading friends I think it's good because then they'll ask me a few questions or they'll want to like know if they're like going through a hard time and they can just ask me so I think it just like makes us closer yeah so how do you feel about getting into the spotlight I think it was good because when I first started I didn't really have a woman speaker to look up to so I did base everything based on my age and the young people that were in the industry so I'm like well we had the same age we didn't go to college so that's how I kind of found the similarities and then I found out like yeah I can actually do it because they're literally the same age but it definitely felt really inspiring because I was able to like be the person that I missed when I went to that first conference And now I've seen a lot of more women traders, but I remember going up and just, it was the first time that I was getting my name tag and it was just like a bunch of guys. And I just like went back to my hotel room, like, okay, I don't know what to say because it's just like a, it was just like a lot. So definitely having a little more like women in the industry would definitely help to like open up and kind of like understand everything like deeper because we we have differences from guys as well. Knowing different kind of like trading styles between women and men, I guess it's it can be a little more conservative at times. So I think it was good that I was able to like speak and also maybe inspire a lot of more women traders that are on the edge of like knowing if they can do it or not. Who do you think is a is a better trader? Like what what gender do you think is a better trader is a better way to ask it. Um, women Harry, there's there's the there's the broad <laughs> spectrum of genders these days, Harry. You can't ask that question. Oh yes. Yeah. We can we can include we can include the other one. I'm I'm gender neutral. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> right. Um what do you think is better? I mean, men or women? Who manages money better? I feel honest. like it doesn't Okay. I'm gonna be honest, completely honest. I think I'll make it comfortable. I think women are better money managers. I think that both can do the same based on practice 
in charting and level two, if you can do all those three, then you're, you're a good trader, no matter the gender. Emotionally, I feel like is where like the difference maker can come in because it's just like generalizing guys are a little more like risk takers, whereas women can be more conservative. We can think about it twice and then eventually then we'll take the trade, I guess could be like one of the differences, like emotionally it might affect us a lot more than a guy would. But I feel like both can be really good traders, no matter who they are, if they know price action, they know process, they know risk, they know level two, then that can just make a good trader, whether it's a guy or a girl. I think women are a hundred percent better at trading than men because yeah. men. I think women are better at running companies. Women are better at pretty much everything. Well, just not yeah. Bud Light. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Because at the at the, trading is very emotional, and yes, women are very emotional. Have this ego superiority. I have to be right. Complex. If I'm not right, there's. I, it can't be. The stock market's wrong. I'm right. And what that leads to, that leads to so more trades just based on hubris of trying to feel right. So really, really good job of taking that ego out of the equation and just trading. the. Yeah, I think that does make sense a lot, though, because ego does play a big role into how you're trading. So I think I think that might be right. So what are some of the most memorable trades that you had that boosted that ego? In a good way. To, yeah, <laughs> in a good way. And then that was going to be my segue to the unsuccessful <laughs> side of that. What were the ones that also humbled you back down to reality? So let's start with the good yeah. ones first. What ones that you were like, look at me, mother, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that was like around February, February um when the otc mania was going on and it wasn't just on one specific trade it was a whole day where we had it was like maybe six or seven panics perfect panics that were going on it was like ocsc tsnp encc it was all of them were panicking and i think that was like my top one best day that i ever had but it, it just came from like all of the practice that i took before but that was definitely my best day and that was February of what year? This year? Um, no, that was 2021. Okay. So February yeah. 21 was the day or whatever day that all those stickers ran. That was the day that you were like, I got this. Yeah. What day crushed you? Um, or I mean, I, feel, I definitely feel like I remember the losses so much more than I do the gains because you can have a lot of like gains but i feel like the losses are so much more meaningful um i would say it would be definitely my tesla trade it was an options trade and that was definitely by far the most heartbreaking loss that i ever had it was also my biggest loss that i ever had so i came from this was in 2022 and I came from trading Tesla all December and January for like two whole months because Tesla, maybe not now, but during those, during those months, it would just take a trend and it would trend all day and it was just perfect. It would either fade, it would either just follow the trend very well. So I was trading it every single day for two, three, four K every single day for a whole two months. And I was very confident. I thought, you know, like I can pretty much read Tesla, like the back of my hand. And that was when during February, that was during the time that option trading kind of like started to come up a little bit between like my friends and like other people like around me. And I was like, you know what, if I can trade Tesla every day consistently, like normally I can long and short, then that means I must be able to options trade. And keep in mind, I, I didn't even watch an options video. Like I was very new to it. I remember I asked a little bit, but I was still very new to it and I wasn't used to the volatil volatility and I wasn't used to the huge percentage differences that it had between just trading it normally. So I decided to options trade and this wasn't even on an A plus day. This was on like stay consistent, make some gains and then just leave. You just woke up and, and went, then, I choose violence today. Pretty <laughs> much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then I lost all of my two months gains. <laughs> 
Oh. That day. Oh my gosh. Oh. Heartbreaking. It was horrible. <laughs> my God. Man. Yeah. It was heartbreaking. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, clearly yeah. I know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Elon will do it that was... to you. He really has a way. <laughs> yeah. It was it was heartbreaking. And I think I took like a few days off as well because it was like a mix of almost everything. It was a mix of feeling too confident that I knew Tesla at the back of my hand. And it was also not knowing enough and just being a total beginner in options trading and not getting used to the volatility and the percentages. And that just all came to a mess. Also revenge trading was also part of, of like the process. It was almost like a whole day kind of thing where I was, I was, I, I was like, I know Tesla, I'm right. This is it. And it wasn't. So then I flipped bias, which was also the worst thing I could do. And that was when I actually made the move that I wanted it to. So that was my most undisciplined, most sad, lost, sad day. Hmm. We all are you a full-time trader now or do you do other things outside of trading for just to get away from the market to earn additional income, things like that? I'm a full-time day trader, but I'm almost done every single day at like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. I don't overstay because I know I probably won't find anything in the afternoon. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, you what? kind of... Uh, oh, sorry. Alex. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. You, you kind of uh, mentioned before how you had a consistent strategy and then um, you kind of had to relearn a new strategy. Maybe you could kind of talk about how, like what that mindset was like, but also um, the mindset that you used to really kind of push you forward and kind of like get back on your feet again, you know, cause I think a lot of people are going through that right now where they had been doing really well through COVID and then uh, this year, or in maybe a little bit to the end of last year, um, and some, you know, some people that even we know, Mari, are struggling like at the start of this year. I feel like everyone's kind of gone through it after COVID. So maybe you could kind of talk about just like relearning a new strategy, what the mindset was like, how you kind of went about it, because it is really difficult when you have made some money to have kind of have to go back to the drawing board and say, OK, I need to reevaluate what's working. I need to reevaluate, uh, you know, my own headspace. I need to kind of, you know, look under the hood and see what's working and what's not. So maybe you can kind of talk about that a little bit. One of the best things that I did that I think I was too late on because last year, like it was a little difficult to kind of like adapt. But this year, what I did was size down all of my, not all of my accounts. I sized down my main account to 30K. Mm -hmm. And that was like the best decision I've ever made. That like eliminated all of like the emotional stress. And it also eliminated huge drawdowns for like no reason at all. Because having like a bigger account can get you out of like very uncomfortable situations easily. But if you have a small account, you have to focus very good on execution or else it's like your account that's going to hurt. So that's kind of like one thing that I did that helped me in order to like adapt to this year. And also I feel like I've gotten enough practice throughout like the year to understand how to like get short the right risk and to know good stock selection. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, to wrap it up, my final question would be, do you have any advice for a new trader or a struggling trader or someone that wants to get into trading in general? I think, um, well, I have, I feel like there's a lot of advice to be given to new traders, but it really helps me to study the first year and just not even open a broker a brokerage account at all, or maybe have one that like you're looking at because the more practice and the more comfortable you are, you'll still have a lot of mistakes, but at least you'll be comfortable with price action, which is like one of the most important things. So one of the good things that I did was at least study before I got into it and just be really cautious and meticulous on what it is that you're trading. And I would say other advice would be before you're thinking on like exponentially growing and kind of scaling up, I would think it's really important that you know for sure what your setup is and what your personality is in trading because everybody's different. You, you can't like imitate someone 
or copy anybody's trades. You have to understand who you are. And that's why I was able to exponentially grow only when I knew myself. So I think that's like another advice I would give. And I guess my third advice would be to, I know that you'll be studying and working a lot in the beginning, but don't forget to like enjoy the little moments that you have because you don't want like trading to change you in a negative way. You just kind of want to imitate what you have outside of the markets also in the market. So not like forgetting to enjoy those little moments because you never know when you'll have them back. So study work, but also be able to have a balanced life and a healthy life. So what are your next goals, aspirations or plans for the future, whether that's in trading or outside of trading? What's next for Mari? Well, I'll keep trading until whatever. <laughs> um, until you die. And, <laughs> <pretty> <laughs> and I mean, I feel like I'm still at an early age where I have to figure out a lot of things. I have to try a lot of new things and kind of have to understand myself. So pretty much just like going with the flow, but understanding that I need to try new things now that I'm younger. Yeah. And also teach my puppy how to also yeah, how to it's all that you got a dog. Dog. You got a puppy? I do. Yeah, but she doesn't like socks. It's like that's like my goal number one right now. <laughs> Say that again. I'm sorry it cut out. I gotta I gotta teach her how to use socks. <laughs> use socks? For yeah. what? <laughs> you know, during the summer here, it, it, the pavement gets really hot. Their little paws like start to hurt. Oh. So I need a teacher, and like the <laughs> summer's coming up, and I don't know. She just gotta learn quick. <laughs> I had a Rottweiler. I had a Rottweiler, and we tried to put her in uh, like rubber, like these protective pads or whatever, and we put them on her, and she was like, <laughs> "Yep, I don't like this." And she like didn't. She forgot how to walk. And, and it was exactly like, why, yeah. What kind of she dog do you back have? Back leg, like always kick back. It's a toy golden doodle. She's like oh, so tiny. Man. Yeah, she's cute. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah. that that Nix is traveling, I guess. <laughs> traveling. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places to see in the world. So Where do you want to go outside of Colombia? What's your top one? vacation spot Top one canada um, no 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 <laughs> i mean no I'm one wants close. to go to canada canadians don't even want to be there you don't even want to be there harry we know this yeah like, <laughs> where do you want to go well i'd like to do the antarctica cruise the what that's like the antarctica cruise oh yeah that's like maybe top one that I do want to so do. I want to do Iceland, Switzerland. Yeah. The Aurora lights are like my like. I, I know. Have to see it. I have to see it before. It, like like I I have to see the Aurora. I have to see the Northern Lights. I have to see all of that before I die. And if I die before that, I'm just gonna haunt everyone that <laughs> sees it. That's where my soul is going to exist. Is up there. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so Iceland. So you like the colder weather then? Iceland. A little bit. Iceland, I like big mountains. Switzerland. Uh, I like big mountains. Hiking. Yeah, long rivers. Just speaking up yeah, my alley. Majestic. Right now, yeah. Like we just majestic left stuff. Yeah, we just <laughs> left Texas and moved to Colorado. So staring Perfect. right at the Rockies. I'm like, yeah, yeah buddy. And the wife and I are <laughs> talking about we're like hiking everything that we can possibly do outside. Good. So, and skiing is good too. I suck at that. Terrible. <laughs> that's, what learn, learn. Bro. that's what I do to injure yeah. myself. If ever I'm like, I need to feel some pain in my life, I just go skiing or I short something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's awesome, Mari. So traveling's in the future. Big puppy socks are yeah. in the future. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Guys, any last questions? Nope, that uh, that does it for me. Thank you, Mario.
Thank you guys. Thank you so much.